for a second. How many people are charged every year who would be suppliers to the Compassion Societies? Does anybody have a figure on that? I, I don't have a figure on that. However, my practice uh, is by and large defending persons accused of violating the cannabis laws in this country. Uh, and I can tell you that a substantial portion of my practice uh, are persons that either produce marijuana for others for medical purposes or for themselves for medical purposes or possess it for medical purposes. Uh, it is not uncommon, uh, and I get calls on a, on a weekly basis. Uh, from people who have run into trouble with law enforcement because of either their me medical cannabis production uh, or use. And oh, oh, just, uh, just to add to that uh, briefly, um, I've published and, and researched uh, medical marijuana in Canada extensively, and there are about 15 well-established uh, dispensaries here in Canada, and about half of them have uh, uh, been uh, the victim of some kind of police enforcement. And so about half of them have, uh, have faced uh, court charges and uh, have been charged with uh, distribution or production of cannabis. And in general, what are the results of those charges? Well, I can tell you on behalf of my clients, I've had some uh, significant successes. Uh, I've mentioned the case of Mr. Barron receiving an absolute discharge for his production. It is not uncommon currently uh, for you to go into court, uh, and typically you'll enter a guilty plea if you're a, a medical cannabis producer for yourself or for others, and you'll put the facts in at a sentencing hearing because that's what sentencing hearings are for. They're for the judge to view the circumstances of the offense and the offender, <laughs> Uh, and it is very common uh, to uh, receive either absolute or conditional discharges. Now, I can tell you this legislation absolutely and completely takes that off the table because the penalty, the maximum penalty for production goes from seven years to 14 years, making these offenses no longer eligible for discharges at all, uh, much less the impact of the mandatory sentences themselves. No, no legitimate dispensary in Canada has ever been successfully prosecuted. Um, this changes completely under Bill C-15. Okay. Um, you, had, you had one person who was charged with a thousand plants. Yes, that's correct. Mr. Barron was. That's a lot of plants. It is. I mean, that's... Well, I mean, what was, I mean, if we were... I'm trying to get some sense here. Uh, first of all, I mean, I think this is a stupid bill. Marijuana shouldn't be in here. Um, and, and it's simply in here because uh, we haven't recognized that it's a lot healthier than Oxycontin or Percocet, That's right. uh, which are commonly used. But what I'm trying to get at is if, I was, if you were going to uh, be a successful uh, grower, um, what would be the number of plants that would be the minimum that you could grow that would work to supply your client? Well, here's the interesting thing. I mean, we have to put it into context, right? A thousand plants sounds like a lot of plants. Um, the reality is I represent people all the time charged with way more plants than 1,000 plants. Uh, it is literally, again, a drop in the bucket uh, in terms of what uh, marijuana is produced in this country. We have to remember Canadians go through somewhere between 6 and 10 million grams of marijuana every week in this country, just ourselves. Uh, we enjoy cannabis. Uh, but... The other thing to put in the context is there was 400 people receiving that cannabis. So, so when you talk about the numbers, it breaks down to about two and a half plants per recipient. Uh, and of course, economies of scale come into play. This was all being grown in one outbuilding, and not a very large outbuilding, in a rural property. Uh, so while a thousand seems like a big number, in the context of marijuana production, it, it's actually not really that big a number at all. So, uh, should, so should we be even putting a number on it? Well, no, I think putting numbers on it is frankly an exercise in absurdity. Uh, what you're going to end up doing is uh, spreading the marketplace out. And so if people know, and now I'm talking non-medical people, if non-medical people know that they're going to be subject to three years for a thousand plants or nine months for under 200 plants, you'll either have 200 really big plants, 199 really big plants, or more likely you'll set up five locations and grow 199 plants in each. And what we actually will end up doing is seeing a proliferation in the number of marijuana production facilities throughout this country. It's exactly the opposite result that I think we all want to achieve, which is to get these uh, production facilities out of suburbs and out of basements, and let's grow this plant where we grow all our other plants, on farms and in greenhouses, so that we don't have to worry about the problems 
that are allegedly associated with marijuana grow arms. If I could just add shortly, the, the, Mr. Barron, the time that he was arrested, was the sole producer for the Vancouver Island Compassion Society. It was our sole supplier for 400 members. As a result of that raid, we now have six different suppliers scattered throughout Vancouver Island and uh, the Gulf Islands who are now supplying our membership. In other words, we've gone from a single, sole, easy-to-manage production facility to six facilities, which is far more challenging to manage. And to put it in a context, those two and a half plants per person, as a legal medical cannabis user in Canada, I'm licensed to produce 49 plants for myself. And so the 49 plants that I'm licensed to produce through Health Canada pales in comparison to the two and a half plants that Mr. Barron was, was producing for, uh, for our members. I suggested to Sergeant Doucette that 30 is considered personal in British Columbia. I, you, you know, I think, I think it's a decent rule of thumb. Um, I, what, I, what I think, if this committee is going to pass this legislation, and I urge it not to, um, but if, it, if this legislation is going to pass, the, the best thing to do to protect medical marijuana users, providers, and distributors is to simply add an exemption uh, taking medical marijuana, not just out of the mandatory minimum sentences, but out of the CDSA entirely. Uh, and in that case, you can still have your prohibition of marijuana to the extent it's uh, needed or wanted, and I don't think it is needed or wanted. Uh, but at least we're not going to be jailing, arresting, and incarcerating people that are doing this uh, for compassionate purposes and to help people that are struggling with illness. And they would have a license. Well, the, the, again, the problem is the government's medical marijuana system is inaccessible. 99.5% of, of the medical marijuana users in this country are not protected. They simply are not protected by the government's regime. But they have, but they have a prescription from their doctor. That's, that most do, yes. The, uh, well, I, mean, you've got, I mean, there has to be some rules. Mm -hmm. the, the state of Oregon uh, and, and a number of U.S. medical marijuana states, and there are 13 states that have legalized medical cannabis use in, in the U.S. now, including California that has tens of thousands of dispensaries, literally. Um, the, uh, the state of Oregon uh, has an affirmative defense program, which means that if you're arrested for use or production or distribution of cannabis, if you can prove it was for medical purposes, you, uh, and you can prove that in court, then the charges are dropped. They also have a state-run medical marijuana program, which is an, an, an interesting comparison with our own, in that it started in 1999. It's centrally run. You need a doctor's recommendation actually join the program, and yet they've registered 20,000 people with one-tenth the population of Canada in the same period of time that we've registered 4,000 people. I think that that really illustrates some of the problems with our own federal bureaucracy and program in regards to medical cannabis. Also gives us an idea of what can and should, be, should happen within our federal program. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Campbell. Senator Royal. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimonies. Um, I listened to carefully to you, Mr. Tosa and Mr. Lucas, especially for my first question, and uh, I was left puzzling because you, you, you argue in your presentation that uh, many of your customers would, or your, uh, the people with who you're, uh, you're in contact daily would find themselves in prisons if that bill would be implemented, I mean passed and implemented. Uh, but when we heard the federal uh, commissioner, uh, the commissioner of the federal penitentiaries, he, uh, he testified in front of us on November the 19th. And uh, in his presentation, and, following, and after that question, uh, in his presentation, he stated the following, and I quote, at this time, we do not have any data to assess whether there will be a direct impact on CSC's population levels, end of quote. And we asked him a question, I personally I asked him a question, and I said, it's strange because if this bill is to have an impact, it's to put people in prison. That's essentially what is the, the, the gist of the bill, is to impose mandatory minimum sentences, and there are sentences, of course, as you saw in the bill, that are higher than two years. So it should have an impact, and uh, there were, his, his answer was very um, elusive, mm -hmm. and I will use a very diplomatic word here. In other words, he didn't want to commit himself that the bill would have a financial impact on the number of people in prison and hence the cost that this bill would entail. 